sorry, technology improving our lives. Um, <laughs> well, I want to thank our speaker for coming tonight. Um, I've been trying to set this up for what better part of a year, it seems like now at this point. And uh, uh, it took us a while to, to get back into the swing of things after all the lockdowns started in and whatnot. So I'm very glad we're able to, to do that this now. Our, uh, our speaker is Dahlia Taft, and uh, she is the archivist with the Orange County Jewish Historical Society. And uh, like a number of us archivists, she is also a historian. And mm -hmm. she is also, um, you know, again, like a lot of us, I see from her work, she's also a cheerleader for local history as well. It's another role <laughs> that, te that, that tends to get overlooked in that is somebody needs to be out there promoting this and getting it in front of people. Because once people know about their local history, they get excited about it. Yeah. And it's, sometimes it's just getting it in front of them and, and showing them that history isn't just picking up a textbook and having to memorize stuff by Monday. Cause you know, that's, <laughs> that's what we all grew up with. And uh, so um, she's uh, as the archivist for uh, OCGH JHS, she is responsible for increasing the awareness of the role of Ju the role Jews have played in the development of Orange County from 1857, when the first Jews settled in Anaheim, to now, she maintains the society's archives and is constantly researching and digitizing the growing collection. She helped organize the group's website and lectures regularly about the different significant periods in Orange County's Jewish history. She also writes a monthly column in J Life. Um, and she wrote and directed a documentary mm -hmm. entitled California Orange Jews. Very clever, by the <laughs> Thank way. Thank you. Thank you. Very clever. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that. Um, just when we thought all of the orange joke, uh, you know, twists on the word orange had been done. You, no, no. We got yeah. one more. <laughs> yeah, one more. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> she has uh, also published a book, uh, which is how I first heard about her, which is uh, Jewish Pioneers of Orange County, which it also is a volume of the uh, Journal of uh, Western States Jewish History, right. uh, detail, which uh, details many stories of Jewish life in Orange County from the 1860s through the 1980s. Um, and uh, I will also point out, I believe, John Morlock, who's yeah. here tonight, uh, wrote the introduction to that yeah. book. Hmm. And John hmm. is a longtime member and friend of ours here at the Society. And really so, uh, helped to promote the book as well. So thank you, John. Um, and yeah, and, and uh, I did some research at his house. I mean, just was a big help for, for the research um, for the book. So thank you. And his wife as well. <laughs> well, with that, Dahlia, why don't you uh, take it away? Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Chris, for introducing me. And um, everything he said is true. Um, I, I find that uh, if, if, if people think that history is just a bunch of dates and what they remember from middle and high school, it's extremely boring. But if you put a face on it and you make it real, um, I just finished watching the Ken Burns um, documentary series on Roosevelt, the Roosevelt family, and it brings it to life. It, 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 it's us in the past and we have so much to learn from our past and, and to use it for the future. So uh, one of the things that I absolutely adore doing um, is lecturing and I was telling Chris this is my first time lecturing or second time lecturing to a group that is not primarily Jewish and I'm thrilled to be able to bring this information to you. Um, I'm going to do broad strokes. It's, it's, I have a, a number, I have documentary, I have PowerPoints. This one is from 1857 when the first um, settlers were here, um, you know, um, in, in terms of after the, um, the establishment of the state and up until 1945 when the first synagogue was established. So um, just a little bit about myself. I'm Jewish, obviously. <laughs> My father is a rabbi um, and he was in the Air Force. He was a chaplain. So I grew up all over the place. I was born in Turkey on a US Air Force base and then lived all over the country, West Coast, East Coast, Midwest, you name it. Um, and one of the first things I told my husband when we were getting very serious was, I will not move a lot. <laughs> I, I, I can't do it anymore. And he said, okay. 
So we moved from LA to Orange County and that's it. Um, and I'm very glad that we did. And um, I'm going to do a slideshow. Please uh, put your questions in the chat um, and then I will be asked them later. And um, I just am very excited to be here and it is the first night of Hanukkah. So happy Hanukkah to all those who um, observe it. And, um, and I am now gonna share my screen and start, here we go. Can everybody see this? Yes, okay. All right, yes. so orange juice, there you go, Chris. I had to do it. <laughs> and um, this is, like I said, from, um, hold on, it's not, oh, there we go. I went too far. Hold on one second, guys. Does anybody know how I go back? Okay, here we go. All right, let's try this again. So this is Ben, I call him Ben, we're on a first name basis. He was the first Jew that we know of. I'm gonna sort of read what's here and then I'll embellish to settle in what would eventually become Orange County. He arrived from San Francisco in 1858 and settled in what had just been established as the new city of Anaheim. And he was a German Jew, uh, Bavarian. Most of the, Jew the Jews that settled here at the beginning were German Jews. There were a few that were not, and we'll go over that. Uh, this is really the best and only photo that we have of him. We have others, but they're not as much of a close-up. But I mean, I, he just strikes me as like somebody I'd like to sit down with and, 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 and have a chat with. And um, he started in dry goods and he eventually became known as the king of the Anaheim winemakers. Um, and he started out um, in this place right here. This was co-owned with a gentleman named August Langenberger, who was also a German immigrant, not Jewish. And this is very important. I'm gonna point out throughout the slideshow that at the very beginning of Orange County, the, the Jews and the non-Jews were very um, uh, comfortable with each other. It, really the biggest thing was that they were, they were German, uh, you know, originally from Germany and they were hardworking and they wanted to start this, this city and, and make it successful. And so you'll see a lot of um, partnerships between Jews and non-Jews, particularly in retail and business. And also I would like you to look at this fence, fencing right here because this building is gonna keep popping up. But you can see at the very beginning, it was pretty isolated. And we think that this might've been Mrs. Dreyfus and Mrs. Langenberger up on the top. Uh, we're not sure but that's a, a guess. And uh, you can see how sparse it is and how really rural it is. So that's important to keep in mind. And what I'm doing is it's not exactly chronological, everybody. It is the, the people that are involved and you'll see as I go on. Okay, so Ben is right here in the hat and we don't know who the other people are. And uh, by the way, a lot of these images are from the Anaheim Library and the Santa Ana Historical Society. So I do wanna give credit to to um, all of these different places, um, some from the Fullerton Library, some from the UCI um, Library. But uh, you can see he's very successful. Um, there is, um, it's, I can't see it because it's blocked by the uh, waiting room uh, dialogue box, but um, this is Center Street and I think it's East 4th, it's cut off a little bit, but he, he was so successful that he then went on to do the second winery. And um, a lot of people may know this building if they've been here for a while, it was split in half and it was near, it's near Disneyland or it was near Disneyland. And it was destroyed in 1971 um, when it was, it just didn't have a use anymore. Today it's a parking lot, unfortunately. But if you see right here in the front how devastated these vines are, this was built in 1885, a year before um, Benjamin died. The grapes all died off due to a virus named Pierce's disease. Uh, in the 1880s, Southern California was vying with Northern California to be a winery, you know, to be the main, not a winery, but to be the wine producing part of California. Pierce's disease did not impact Northern California because of the cooler temperatures up there. And so that is one of the reasons they became um, the place to go and grow wine and we didn't. Um, but very important to know, the first ever kosher for Passover wine that was produced in the United States was produced in this winery. 
um, by Ben Dreyfus. He also did kosher for Passover um, brandy and vinegar. All of these things have to be um, gone through a whole process. It's called koshering. And I have the advertisement. And so we, Anaheim lays claim to the first ever mass produced kosher for Passover wine in the United States of America. So, and that was in 1864. Um, you can see here, it says B. Dreyfus and Company. This is the only sample of letterhead that I have been able to find. And if you notice, the letter is written in German. This is 1885. That was the main language used in Anaheim in, in um, city meetings, in, when they did business. Most of the people that settled there at the very beginning were German immigrants, Jewish and non-Jewish. Um, and it was used well into the 1890s. And I don't know if people are familiar with the, the 50 German um, pioneers that started uh, the city of Anaheim. They were originally from San Francisco. They came down here. This was a business venture. A third of them were Jews. Um, and that is something that I was shocked to discover and a lot of people don't know. And okay, so this, this gentleman is also from originally from Germany. His name was Morris. It was Moritz, M-O-R-I-T-Z. He Americanized it. Um, and Goodman, and he uh, was in Los Angeles. He was very involved in LA. Um, he was the first um, Jewish councilman on the newly established LA City Council in 1850. He was very active in the Masons and he's buried in Anaheim um, in the Mason section of the Anaheim Cemetery, which is non-sectarian. Um, he was in business with Theodore Rimpaw. So this is another Jewish, non-Jewish business venture. And he was also very, very, um, um, interested in education. That was very important to him. And he helped set up the first school in Anaheim, the Laura School, L-O-A-R-A, -A, which is still there as a high school today, by the way. Um, very important and um, very involved in, in the committee, in the uh, development of the community. And again, I'm skipping around chronologically because I do want to show you, you know, the, the thread starting with um, with Goodman, but you can see here, I don't know how well you can see it on your screens, but there's Hippolyte Cahan. He was Jewish. Goodman and Rimpaw, Goodman was Jewish. Here, remember I talked about that awning at the top, the, the fence, um, that is, or the porch, this is the original building. You can see how much has been built up around it. So you've got one, two, three um, Jewish stores in and out of five. Um, and this is a bank um, that eventually um, was owned by Barry Goldwater's great uncle. Um, so it's just, it's, it's fascinating to, to see the history here. Um, okay, so I don't know if people have heard of the Native Daughters of the Golden West. It's very similar to the Daughters of the Revolution on the East Coast. It is a pioneer um, organization. And Right here, they had just, this group had just established themselves and they received this beautiful umbrella that you see here from a sister organization up in San Francisco. The woman all the way on the right in the red, uh, I mean, in the white uh, dress, her name is Adelaide Ann Meyerholtz Cahan. She was the wife of Hippolyte Cahan, who's the gentleman who owned the store in the previous picture. She was not Jewish. Um, their descendants continue to live in Orange County and I've been in contact with them. They had no idea that um, that they had any Jewish uh, ancestry at all, so they were they were thrilled to hear that, um, and I got some wonderful images from them um, once we connected. This I love. Okay, Lewis Wartenberg was the first Jewish marshal of Anaheim from 1877 to 79. In honor of the Anaheim Police Department's 150th anniversary back in 07, they commissioned a replica of his original badge, and the police uh, members you know, members of the police force could purchase it for $60 as, a, you know, sort of a, a souvenir, if you will. Um, it's also, um, this is just a fact, but it's a five-pointed, a six-pointed star, which is what a Jewish star is, the Star of David, and a lot of sheriff's stars are, but I just thought that was wonderful. Um, the first circumcision in Orange County was performed on uh, Mr. Wartenberg's son, Michael, on March 5th, 1877, and it was announced in the local newspaper. Um, so, and there were a number of other circumcisions that were announced as well. The, the, the Jews were completely, um, you know, they were part of the culture. They, 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 some of them intermarried with non-Jews, uh, most of them didn't. And they were very, um, they were very much a part of the progress of this county. Okay, it's hard to see, but down here it says Steinhardt and brother, because he had one brother that was with him. 
he was a well-respected businessman and Anaheim Hotel was the hotel. Um, that was where you stayed, that was where you went and to have um, uh, you know, a business in the hotel was good. I mean, you got a lot of traffic and he did accounting. That's what he did. And so he was very successful. He was originally from um, Alabama. His parents were German Jewish immigrants from Alabama. And this is him. I love, I love the, uh, the mustache, it's very happening. Uh, he was the first Jewish postmaster in Anaheim. It was from 1869 to 1870. He married Henrietta Davis, and we'll talk about the Davis brothers in a moment. He is listed as a California pioneer um, by the Native Daughters of the Golden West, that, which I already explained. And there are three others, Levi Gildmacher, um, whose descendants are also still here. Um, Benjamin Dreyfus, who we talked about, and Gustav Davis, and their um, biographies are recorded in the Library of Congress. So they, they are well established as not only Jewish pioneers, but as pioneers of, of Orange County. Okay, love this guy, love the hair. Uh, this is Gustav Davis. He and his brother were originally from Poland, and uh, their name was changed to Davis just because it was easier. It was Cherinsky. And they opened a store under the name P. Davis and Brother. Um, P. was his brother, um, Philip. Philip was older, so he got the P. He got the first designation. They built a new store building on Lincoln Avenue in 1878, and it featured the first elevator in, in what is now Orange County. It wasn't Orange County yet. That didn't happen until 1889. And he married Helena Mendelssohn, and I'll talk about the Mendelssohns a little bit later. So, uh, and she was a sister of uh, San Juan Capistrano pioneer, Max Mendelssohn. So you had a lot of these families um, marrying, you know, you know, because they were Jewish and, the, the, you know, so they would marry, you know, a sister would marry the brother from another family, et cetera. And you have a number of those uh, happening. Okay, so I mentioned P. Davison brothers. Here it is right here. And um, you can see, again, you see the, the uh, Dreyfus store and the buildings that are growing up around it. And what I love is you see back here, brewery uh, and the pine tree is, is uh, blocking the beginning of it. It was Anaheim's first brewery and it was called Anaheim Brewery. It was owned by Solomon Goldstein, obviously Jewish and Samuel Davis, who was not Jewish uh, and not related to the Davis brothers here who changed their name. Solomon Goldstein um, is still honored. Anaheim Brewery opened up again and the owners now named a beer after him. And if you go to their store, not now, but after the pandemic, or their, their um, brewery and bar in Anaheim, uh, you will see um, a commemoration to Samuel Gold, uh, Solomon Goldstein, also known as Samuel. It went back and forth. So again, another um, case of Jewish uh, involvement in the beginnings of Orange County. And also the first murder happened in Goldstein's saloon. So not a good fact, but a fact. All right, so remember I mentioned um, Gustav Davis, you saw him right here. This is his son, Harry, in, graduated in 1893 and he is, they're all holding diplomas. And I think what's very important to point out, he's Jewish, most of them are white. Here we have a young um, Latina woman. So it was the schools were somewhat integrated. Um, and this is Luara High School, um, which um, was started again, it was, when Anaheim was established, they didn't have a church for 10 years, but they had a, a school immediately. And I think that points to the value that these German pioneers had for education. Um, and Ad Astra is Latin for to the stars. Um, and obviously Loara is still here, much bigger than this. Um, okay, now we're moving to Santa Ana, just briefly. Uh, this is the T and E Rheinhaus uh, Millinery, which is a hat, hat makers. And there were three sisters, Teresa, Emily, and Pauline. I don't know why Pauline didn't get her initial up there, but she didn't. They were sisters to Max and Julius Reinhaus, and I'll talk about them in a moment. Um, and they, this was a very well-known shop. And you can see, I mean, they're tiny, but the doors, how big the doors are. This is Dr. Marcus Reinhaus. He was visiting from Germany for the occasion of this beautiful photograph. And I just love the architecture and the pillars and, um, it, you know, they didn't save a lot of that, but 4th Street is still the place in Santa Ana for business. Okay, and here we go. Reinhouse Brothers, these were the brothers of the two, the three sisters we just saw. This was a huge department store at 4th and Bush in Santa Ana, and it was owned by Max and Julius. 
Um, there were eight Reinhaus siblings who immigrated to the United States from Germany in the late 1800s. They were the largest Jewish family in town and the Reinhaus department was in business for close to 40 years. And this is an ad in the Daily Evening Blade, which was a competitor of the Register uh, in 1900. And so continuing with the Reinhaus is this young man down here, Stanley Reinhaus, born and raised in Orange County in Santa Ana. And um, he went to Santa Ana High School and this is the graduating class of 1908. Uh, he went on to graduate from UC Berkeley with a law degree and he returned to Santa Ana, practiced law, raised a family in the same house that he grew up in. Um, that house is still there, um, not in great shape now, but, uh, but it, it, it is there. I called this guy Sir Herman, uh, Herman Stern. He, um, he worked, he had a store in Anaheim and he was incredibly involved in the Knights of Pythias. And this is him in a uniform, an official photograph. Uh, it was a men's fraternal organization similar to the Oddfellows and the Masons, all of which were extremely popular um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It, that was their schmoozing. That was where they met. That was where they talked about business. Um, he was the brother of Jacob Stern, who was a businessman and land developer in Yorba Linda. And I'll talk about Jacob also in a moment. Um, this is uh, Mr. William Falkenstein, and he was married to Regina Harris. The Harris department stores in San Bernardino were a very big deal um, in San Bernardino County. And so again, I'm talking about the families marrying the Jewish families that would, you know, say, oh, I have a son, I have a daughter, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they stayed within the faith for the most part. And he was in business with a gentleman named Isidore Asher, and their store was established uh, as early as 1901 in Anaheim. And here it is, Asher and Falkenstein right there. And um, we don't know exactly when this picture was taken. That's why it's, you know, first decade of the last century. The American flags indicate to us that this was taken during the month of July because the bunting is up. And this was a very popular store. You can still see not the horse, but the buggy right here and, and people lined up. Uh, to have their picture taken and a, a fire hydrant. So the, the city was well on its way. This is probably my favorite photo of all of them in this slideshow. This is Buster Brown Shoe Promotions Day. I don't know who knows about Buster Browns. I grew up with them. They were awesome shoes. Everybody knew about them. By now, it's just William Falkenstein. Asher, um, he, Falkenstein bought out Asher. Asher moved on to San Bernardino. But you can see all the boys lined up with their fathers in the background waiting for the store to open. And, um, and again, we have a mix of people. We've got, this is, uh, looks like a Latino boy. And we've got um, some kids don't have shoes, some kids do. We've got a dog. Um, and right here, this building right here was the Fetter building. That's another Jewish um, owned building, the Fetters who, um, or Fettermen, sorry. And they eventually moved back to LA but they, were, they had a, a department store. Okay, so remember we mentioned Isidore Asher who co-owned the store with William Falkenstein. His daughter, Gertrude, right here, she was the um, um, queen of the Orange County Fair before it was the Orange County Fair. It, this was the precursor to the fair. And uh, she went to what was called the Normal School, it's now UCLA. And she went on to become a school teacher, eventually moved to San Bernardino with her, her family. But um, this is her court. And it's just a wonderful photo. This photo was granted to us by the family, um, the descendants of, of, um, of Gertrude. And there was a whole article about her in the, in the um, OC register. It's wonderful. We have a lot of stuff on her. Okay, so here she is right here. And this is official, the official photo and what I love, we don't change. This woman right back here, you can tell she's a little, little PO'd there. Like, why aren't I the queen? Um, same here. So some things never change. But this was, uh, it was a very hot day. So I can't even imagine um, how uncomfortable they were. But this was my latest acquisition uh, during the pandemic. I've been sort of scouring eBay and trying to see what I can find. This is an original pen um, with silk um, ribbons that was a souvenir of this, it was called the Carnival of Products from 1909. And it is now in our archives. And I'm incredibly proud to have that as part of our collection. 
All right, um, this is, I'm going back to San Juan Capistrano, I mentioned the Mendelssohn's. Max Mendelssohn was pretty much the only Jewish pioneer down south in San Juan Capistrano. This inn, which was the Mendelssohn Inn, the Mission Inn, the Mendelssohn Mission Inn, um, was, was a big deal well into the 1930s, and it was a destination point for locals and celebrities alike. And little known fact, there was a very famous statue at the, um, at the San Juan Capistrano Mission of um, uh, the, I think it's the Franciscan father with a boy who looks to be a Native American. It's actually Max's grandson. Who, who was the, um, the model for that sculpture. Uh, I think he was 14 at the time. And this is a postcard and I'm in the process, this is a bad screen grab. I am in the process of purchasing this as well, the original postcard. This we have, this is another one of our acquisitions. So I mentioned Stern before, the Knights of Pythias. This is a 1908 um, invoice from the Stern and Goodman store was opened in 1898, again, by German Jewish immigrants and cousins, Jacob Stern and Joseph Goodman. Joseph Goodman was not related to the Goodman that I mentioned earlier, Morris Goodman. The original store grew to almost an entire city block. Um, and you can see it from the etching right here um, on the invoice. And it had five branches, thus becoming California's first chain store. Um, to thank their many customers, the store would hold a barn dance every spring to which everyone in Orange County was invited. The annual event held in a big building near the train station was attended by hundreds. And, um, and again, I, you know, brought forward a stool at 65 cents. You've got um, tomatoes, a dollar 10, sugar, peaches, it, you know, it's just, it's wonderful. This is, this is history come alive. And right there, paid Stern and Goodman, Fullerton, California. I mean, this, this stuff, I don't know, I just, get very excited. <laughs> um, sorry about the phone. Um, okay, this is bringing us forward a little bit to the uh, the Feinbarg family. Right here is Alan Feinbarg. Um, and I do have to do a shout out to the Feinbargs because they are the reason I have my job. They have uh, funded the Orange County Jewish Historical Society with an endowment that will last forever. And I always give a shout out to them when I do a lecture because I'm forever grateful. Um, Alan passed a while ago, about four or five years ago. His wife, Sandy, is, um, is still alive and, and uh, wonderful, wonderful woman. And they, he and his wife and now his wife have contributed substantially to Jewish and secular causes in Orange County. And they came from Michigan. His parents were Russian Jewish immigrants. And that's his older brother, Alan. Here he is again, right there. Um, and again, this was also gifted to the Historical Society. This is Willard Junior High School in Santa Ana. I think it's still there. I'm not sure, but this was in 1934. And, um, and he became a big leader in the, in the community here. But like I said, both Jewish and non-Jewish. And continuing with Santa Ana, this is uh, an actual ad. It's a little frayed, but I preserved it the best that I could. Sam Hurwitz had a haberdashery. Um, and he, he basically was sort of the welcoming committee, religious service organizer, all around information center for anybody Jewish in Orange County. So anybody that would come to Orange County, they, everybody would say, oh, go to Sam. Sam will hook you up. He'll get you taken care of. Now we have a plethora of organizations that can do that. But before there, were anything, there was anything established, Sam was the man to go to. And he was also instrumental, he and his wife, Edith, in establishing the first synagogue here, which is right here. This is Temple Beth Shalom in 1945. It was a church and then it became a, the, the synagogue and now it is a church again. So it's been a place of worship forever. It was founded in 1943, um, but it, they didn't get a building um, until 1945. And a lot of people that I've interviewed have very fond memories. It is a reform synagogue. I don't know if people are not Jewish. We have denominations just like in Christianity. So you have reform, conservative and um, Orthodox and I'm conservative, it's, it's sort of the mid range. Orthodox is more um, traditional and reform is, is, is a little more, a um, little less traditional, if you will. Um, and that brings me to the end of my slideshow. So that's a very, very quick overview. And if people have questions, I would be happy to answer them and I can give my, uh, my email so people can contact me if they want. And um, John Morlack, like I said, this is the book. 
uh, that he wrote the introduction to. It's called Jewish Pioneers of Orange County. I do, normally when I lecture, I bring them with me and I sell them at the lecture. But if people are interested, um, this goes into much more detail about the community here. And um, it's, it's supposed to be $25, but I've always sold it for 20. <laughs> so um, don't tell anybody. Um, and it's chock full of pictures and uh, articles. And um, if people are interested in the Jewish community here in more detail, this is an excellent resource. It's also at the UCI library. It's at the Mormon library. Um, and um, it's at, a, it's at um, a number of synagogues and Tarvut Torah, which is a local Jewish um, school. It's at their library. So, and I'm trying to get it into more, I want to get it into public schools. I would like to have it in public schools as a reference source, particularly high schools. That's it. All right. Well, thank you so much. That's, that's fantastic. You'd have all, if I didn't have everybody mute them themselves, you'd, there'd be applause all over the place. That's okay. <laughs> now my phone rang in the middle of it. It's fine. Try, I to, try, to, try to pick your applause. Um, <laughs> Uh, so let's look at some of the questions people have posted in the chat here. Um, let's see. Uh, in your research, have you come across any Jewish women of Orange County who were suffragists? Yes. So there was a, a, a wonderful woman um, whose name was, um, I don't have it right in front of me. Um, oh, this is going to bother me. Uh, Tannenbaum. Her name was Tannenbaum. She was Jewish and uh, a very driven. And um, she went on to become a doctor, which was highly unusual in the 1910s to the 1920s. And she was a suffragist. She was, I guess, what would be called an early feminist. Uh, she got married in a pantsuit, which just cracks me up in the 1920s. She married a gentleman, uh, also Jewish, who was a professor. And uh, they went on to have three children. Um, and um, and but she was way ahead of her time. I mean, just way ahead of her time. And she was very involved in the suffragist movement. So that's the only one I know of. I'm sure there were probably others, um, but I don't I don't know who they would have been. But I do know about her. Um, I see the next one. Where was the Mendelssohn Mission located? Uh, it across the street from uh, the mission from the mission. Literally across the street from the mission. Um, so. I have, hold on one second, if you don't mind. I can get a direct answer for you, hold on. There's some wonderful paintings that I also have in the archives of the mission uh, from, painted from the Mendelssohn Inn. Like the My understanding the was always, it was, if it's what I'm thinking of, I think it's sort of next to where the Ortega store is. Yes, Gary that's Oliver's exactly right. Ortega store. Um, but like, you know, one building further away from the mission. Yes. Uh, still stones throw from the, from what's now the entrance. That's uh, correct. You yeah. could look, you could see, I mean, you could see it from the, from the hotel, from the inn. Sorry, my laptop's trying to warm up here. It needs coffee. Um, but yeah, Chris, you answered the question. That is where it is. And if you go to San Juan Capistrano today, there's a small park across from the mission and there's a plaque there commemorating the spot where the mission inn was. And it talks about the family and um, their history there. Not only that, you can walk around that park and still pick up bits of that building. Yeah. They're just, yeah, yeah it's- uh, It's amazing. It's archeology. span Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, let's see here. Um, were the women active in the business of their husbands and if so, in what capacity? They, some of them were, um, I tried to uh, mention it if that's the case, uh, would Sam Hurwitz know, his wife Edith was not, she was very involved in the Jewish community uh, on a volunteer basis, but you know, in terms of the timing, most of the time the women were, um, they were raising their children, it was, you know, it was the, it was the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, so not so much. Um, but they were always involved in synagogue activities, or if there wasn't a synagogue, in Jewish activities, 
um, but sort of behind the scenes. It was more of a behind the scenes situation. That changed later uh, as women, you know, felt more comfortable being in the workplace, but, but at the beginning, not so much, not so much. Um, and I see here a question about the first Jewish cemetery. So the answer to that is there was not a Jewish cemetery here. When Jews died, uh, they would take the body to LA, which is very unusual because according to Jewish law, the body must be buried as soon as you can after one passes. Uh, some Jews were married in the non-sectarian Anaheim uh, Cemetery, um, but what they would do is often they would bury them right away for them to be there, you know, to, to fulfill the Jewish law. And then they would move the body afterwards a lot, like Ben Dreyfus was moved up to San Francisco, which, which has a, a, a lot of Jewish cemeteries, a number of Jewish cemeteries. Some people were moved to um, LA, but I don't know if people are aware uh, where Dodger Stadium is, used to be a cemetery, both Jewish and non-Jewish. And there were a number of Jews that were buried there. And when they built Dodger Stadium, they had to move the bodies, obviously, out of respect. And so uh, those bodies were moved to various different cemeteries. But, but th that was where the, the early Jews um, were buried, and then some in San Francisco, but most in Chavez Ravine in, um, in LA. Um, and now we do have a number, we, not specifically Jewish, but there are a number of places where you know, Jewish sections where, where Jews are buried. All right. Uh, so next question, where did the Jewish community worship since they didn't have their own synagogue until the mid 20th century in homes, Los Angeles? Okay, great question. Wonderful question. So the answer is most of the time in homes. So there were, it was such a small community and they were centered originally in Anaheim and then later on in um, Santa Ana. So they would get together if there was a wedding, literally, Sam Hurwitz's daughters, one would play the piano and one would bake. And then the mother would host them at their house and they would get married and they would bring in a rabbi from LA. Um, for the high holidays, which are um, for the Jewish New Year, which is Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, um, which if people aren't observant, they do tend to go at least to those two services, uh, which happen usually in September, they would go to LA that they would take the drive, which was a long drive, there was no freeway, um, and they would go to Boyle Heights most of the time. That was that was where the, it was like the Lower East Side of LA. That was where the Jewish community was in LA. Um, and there was one family that had a, a Torah, that's the Jewish, you know, that's the scroll um, that you, and you have to have that for, for Saturday for Sabbath services and for holidays. Um, and that would go from home to home. And it was very protected. Uh, one. Uh, person actually, um, Sam Hurwitz brought one over uh, when he immigrated to the United States, carried it with him on the boat and then on the train all the way to California um, so that they would have a, a way to worship. So, um, so, so both, but mostly, you know, locally in homes, but for the big holidays in LA. Great question. All right. Um... Uh, any any idea of the population of Jewish residents? I'm not sure if that means at some point in history or now, or I guess you can address that. <laughs> and then uh, the other question, uh, appropriate for Orange County being, yep. you know, agriculture for most, was, most, was most of its history. Any farmers? Yes. So the, the answer is the population now is estimated and actually the Jewish Federation is in the midst of doing a demographic study. It's for the last 10 to 15 years, it's been estimated between 80 and 100,000. And you have to understand that with, with, with Jews, everything is complicated. And so who is a Jew and who is not a Jew? Um, it depends on what denomination you're in. Uh, traditionally, if your mother is Jewish, then you are a Jew. Even if you were raised Catholic and your father was, it doesn't matter if your mother is Jewish. You, um, even if you don't consider yourself Jewish, Jews consider you Jewish. But whatever, I mean, you know, it is what it is. Um, but a lot of people, like the Reform Movement, now says if one parent is Jewish, mother or father, you're considered Jewish. So, it, you know, who is a Jew is 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 a constant question. So, but I would say people who, who, the way I look at it is if you identify as Jewish, then you're Jewish. I mean, you know, if you feel you're part of the tribe, then you are. 
Um, but don't quote me because my father will be very mad at me. My father's a rabbi. So um, at this time in the early 20th century, we really don't know. We, do, we don't have any way of knowing, it, but it, very few, maybe 10,000 out of the, I mean, Orange County was very sparsely populated as well. And Jews have always been a very small percentage, but we've always been here, but a very small percentage of the larger population. Most Jews who came here were businessmen and women by far um, at the very beginning because they were immigrants and immigrants are always about how do I make enough money so that my kids can go to college and they can improve and they can do what they want. I'm just here, you know, just trying to make a living. They were in dry goods. They were in the wine industry. Um, and there were farmers. I mean, Dreyfus was a farmer. I mean, he was a vintner, but he, you know, he had, he had vines. I mean, he, he raised crops. Uh, not a lot. A small percentage, though, were farmers. Um, after World War II, uh, and even a little bit before that, you started getting more professionals. So we're already talking second generation of Jews. So their parents worked very hard so that they could achieve. And these are the children who went to college. And so you had accountants and you had, um, you know, doctors and dentists and lawyers. So you started having more educated with the second generation. And after World War II, a lot of the soldiers that were stationed from back east out west fell in love with California and particularly Orange County and said, I want to live here. And so we saw a huge boom, not just in the Jewish population, but in the population overall. Um, and again, Jews as a part of that. Um, and they were really big in the, um, in the aviation industry. Um, a lot of my father-in-law came out here from, from Brooklyn because he he's an engineer and they, he was hired um, by one of the, uh, one of the aviation companies to come out here. So that's how he got out here. Um, and there were, like I said, there were some farmers, but that was unusual. That was unusual. We're not really known as people of the land, <laughs> except in Israel. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I'm going to um, hop over the question about the the mission in because I think we just kind of covered that. It's uh, not. It's not for yeah, me at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, recognize your pre that your presentation does not cover Second World War, although I think we may have you back to give another talk covering okay. more of the history and in the to. in the future. Um, but uh, could you comment on the political environment for the Jews during World War II? Yeah, that's a, again, a really good question. A lot of the Jews that were here um, up leading up to World War II were the descendants of German Jews. And so they had German sounding names like Reinhaus and Wartenberg. Um, you know, Dreyfus is a, is a Jewish name, but there were a lot of them that, that didn't have particularly Jewish names, but were Jewish. Um, and some of them changed their names because of the anti-German sentiment. Um, Jews tended to kind of be quiet. They were in the background. Uh, it wasn't negative for them. Um, after World War II, a lot more Jews moved here, but also you have the John Birch Society, um, which was a problem. You know, they, they were, you know, all Jews were communists. And, and you know, I have stories I know I saw um, Dale Glasser is here, but his father told me a story that, um, you know, he, he was uh, Sam Horowitz's son-in-law, the gentleman I mentioned, who was like the one, you know, the one man greeting committee for the Jewish population. And he told me stories about how they would be in their, you know, they owned a, a clothing store and, you know, somebody would come in and they knew it was somebody from the John Birch Society trying to find out that the Jews were having a secret communist meeting and they were talking about, you know, what are the receipts for the day? And, it, you know, how many coats did you sell? Um, so there, there was, you know, and there were, there were anti-Semitic um, pamphlets that were put out. But the truth is, generally speaking, the Jews that were here, we did really well. You know, um, there, it was, there was an acceptance that, you know, there, there were certain organizations Jews couldn't go to. I know somebody who had tried to get um, a party for her son in the 70s. And when they asked what the party was for, and she said his bar mitzvah, suddenly the venue wasn't available. I mean, there were there were instances, but overall, this the the West Coast in general was was has been really welcoming uh, to the Jewish population. Orange County, you know, we had the Ku Klux Klan um, in the 20s, but the truth is, and a lot of people don't know, and they should know that the, 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 um, the, the city board or whatever it was in Anaheim um, shut that down. They did not want the Ku Klux Klan in their city. And the Ku Klux Klan had said, you know, this is the ideal American 
you know, city because of the German ancestry um, and the German pioneers, and they did not know a third of them were Jewish. And um, there was a parade. And um, so what ended up happening was the, the whoever was the sheriff or the, the marshal um, went up and pulled the, the hood off of one of the demonstrators, you know, one of the people in this parade. And it turned out to be somebody very prominent in the Anaheim business community. Um, and that kind of put an end to it. You know, at that point they realized they were not wanted here. And that was, those were non-Jews that were doing that. And I, I think not enough is said about that, that, that the non-Jews in power in Anaheim basically rode the KKK out of town. And that is something that we should all be hugely proud of. And that was during the twenties. Yeah, I think that's always I, that's always the story with Anaheim that gets missed because everybody focuses on the fact that the Klan kind of snuck themselves into power to take over city government. Right. You know what? They were big all over the country, and that was happening everywhere. Yeah. The news the news flash in Anaheim is they got rode out of town on a rail. That's right. That's, that's the news flash. So the exactly next time right. somebody tries to tell you, "Oh, Klanaheim, what a terrible city," it's like. Uh, no, you kind of got that backwards. You do. And oh. people don't, they, they're like Orange County. And yeah, and this is part of what I do. This is what I love doing is I love busting these myths. I love busting these myths because this is, this, this place has been really good for the Jewish people. And I, I, I want, I want to shout that from the rooftops. I mean, yes, there was some subtle anti-Semitism and that persisted, but the, but the truth is from the very beginning, Orange County has been, has been good, really good for the Jews. So thank you. <laughs> What's the best way for researchers to contact your library? Okay, so right now the library is closed. Um, the best way to reach me is um, my my email, and I can give that to you right now. It's, it's history at JFFS. That's J like Jewish, F as in Frank, another F as in Frank, and then s as in sam dot org so history at jffs dot org that is that's my official um email and if you email me i will get back to you um and you can you can call my phone but i'm not in my office i mean i haven't been in my office since march so i'm sure it's extremely dusty um but i, I they've closed the building so I'm still not allowed in. And it's, it's been interesting because I have a lot of stuff that I need to reference and I need to you know, access and I have not been able to, unfortunately. Uh, there's a question here. I'm not sure I understand it myself, but perhaps okay. you will. Uh, it says, talk about the Jewish father of Suring, S-U-R-I-N. Oh, surfing. Oh, surfing, oh. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, so. Um, Hello, Susan Katz. So I'm, hold on one second, because I, this is a great story too. Thank you for bringing that up. I should add that to the slide, but that's before, after 1945. So hold on. Sorry guys, I just need to get, I wanna make sure. Okay, so his name was Doc Paskowitz and, um, let me get this here. And there was also another gentleman named Walter Hoffman who was very involved. Um, I just want to give you the right details. So, okay. Um, hold on. Okay, so he was originally from Texas, Mr. Paskowitz, and he went to Stanford. A very, very smart man, uh, became a doctor, and then decided during the 60s to leave it all behind. Um, because he loved surfing and he became a surfer. He went to Israel and he introduced surfing to this very young state of Israel in the 1960s and they still honor him to this day. And um, he, he was really a hippie. He married um, a woman who converted to Judaism. Uh, she was from Latin America, uh, I think South America. And um, they had nine children eight sons and finally one daughter. And I think that's when she said, I am done. Um, they lived in a, a trailer, believe it or not. Um, and they traveled all around the country. 
Um, and they still, there's still a school. There's a Pasqua School of Surfing um, in, I think it's near San Onofre. And um, he, uh, he, he was observant. He prayed every morning. Um, there's a, a tradition that Jewish men do, some Jewish women now, where, where they wrap their arm with a leather strap and they put something around their head. It's called tefillin. And that has to do with God's name is, is here and here. And the, it's from a prayer. It's from the, the Bible, actually, that you should remember. You should have a, a signpost on your forehead and on your arm that you should remember that God is always with you. And so um, very religious Jewish men, and I, I, again, some women do this every morning. And he did every morning um, and they kept kosher and they, they, they observed the Sabbath in this tiny little trailer with, you know, eight children or nine children and the mother and father. Um, when he passed away in 2014, um, you know, he was, he was commemorated. He was talked about. I had never heard of this gentleman, um, but he was a big deal. And that is the father, a Jewish father of surfing. So thank you from Susan Katz for bringing that up. Good story. Yeah, great uh, story. Yeah. Uh, I think we've talked about population some already. Mm -hmm. um, having a little. I'm seeing a question from Jane River, and I don't know the answer to it. The Cohn family of Anaheim. I know there was a family in Orange who were involved with the, with the wool industry, with the Basque sheep herders, and um, in Santa Ana as well. Um, this one, Jane, is something I will have to look up because I'm, I, I've not heard of this name. Um, I know that, um, um, one of the early, um, Guildmacher, Levi Guildmacher, um, was very involved with the Basque sheep herders. He was from Santa Ana and he was friendly with them and, um, and he was also involved. He would, he would help them out. He would give them loans. And if they couldn't pay because things didn't go well, he would, uh, he would, he would, you know, float them. Uh, and he was very well revered and respected. That was Levi Gildmacher, who I did not talk a lot about, but he was from Santa Ana. And his descendants, by the way, still live in Anaheim. I mean, still live in Santa Ana. His great, great granddaughter is a, uh, she's a doctor in Santa Ana. So they're still here. Well, Krista Nichols from the uh, from Preserve Orange County asks, uh, are there any buildings in Orange County associated with Jewish history that you'd like to see protected? Unfortunately, um, the one that I really wanted to see protected was destroyed in 1971, and that was um, Ben Dreyfus's winery. Um, there are, you know, there are a few buildings that are under protection for other reasons, like the first synagogue is now a church and the first Jewish community center is in Laguna Beach and it was the post office and it is a protected building. Um, the house that um, the Ryan House family um, lived in and grew up in um, is owned, it's, it's run down and it's owned by another family. Um, so there's not, we don't have that here. We really don't have that. I, I, you know, people have asked me that before. They're like, can you give a tour of, you know, Jewish sites? And uh, not really, you know, a lot of the, the stores that were owned by Jewish um, uh, people in Santa Ana on 4th Street, if you look on the floor in front of a lot of those stores, you'll see tile and it'll say Lorenz Jewelry. That was a Jewish owned store. So you'll see things like that. But a lot of those beautiful, beautiful tile work entryways were, were, were pulled up and destroyed. There's very few of them left. And I'd love to see those preserved, but again, you know, the store owners, they're not required to, you know? Um, so I wish I could say yes, but no, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I'm not sure how you one would answer that. What was the family in orange? Boy, that could be probably a long list. No, there was actually, hold on, it's, uh, no, I, hold on, I wrote an article on this. Ah, uh, okay. So let me, I'm blanking on the name, but hold on. All right, if you give me a minute, I will get the name for you because that's a wonderful story. Um, 
there's so many, I, you know, you were saying that there's so many things that are, that are here um, that we don't even really know about, but they're, they're like, sometimes I think, oh, I'm not going to be able to find a column to write because I write a monthly column and I always find something. There's always something. So if you'll just bear with me. For sure. Have you written much about uh, Sam Stein at all? In San yeah, Diego? he's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 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 Sam <laughs> was, Sam had the, uh, while you're looking, I'll just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Sam had the uh, stationery, the big stationery store yep. in uh, downtown Santa Ana on 4th Street. And he, um, that business continued on long after he passed. Yeah. And uh, he was, you know, clearly one of the best loved people in Santa Ana because yep. when he did die and he was uh, uh, basically the whole town shut down. Yeah. Because everyone had to come to the memorial for him. Mm -hmm. And you know, when the whole city shuts down for your memorial, it means you did something right in your life. Yeah. <laughs> it, absolutely. I'm not finding it. Um, you know, Tracy, if you wanna um no, who was it that asked that? Whoever asked that, if you wanna email me, um, I'm blanking on the name, but it's there was two brothers. So and they were very said, I, Jane writes, I meant the orange family that worked with the sheep herders. Yes, I know. Oh, was that was Guildmacher. Guild that, that was not orange. That that family was uh, the Guildmacher family was in Santa Ana. That was uh -huh. Levi Guildmacher, G-I-L-D-M-A-C-H-E-R. They changed their name, the spelling to G-I-L-M-A-K-E-R, and they're now Catholic. Um, but that was he was he was beloved um the the family in orange was a different family they were also very um helpful i'm sorry i'm, I'm just blanking on that name which is upsetting to me <laughs> all right i don't well, have it here you can tell us all about that at the next uh, at the next there you time go. This. perfect there okay. you go um another question here do you have a history of benji's restaurant in yeah, have they, uh, are they from Pioneers? No, they're not from Pioneers. They're, it's a New York family that moved out here. Uh, there's a wonderful picture um, that I have that we, we got from um, uh, one of the magazines. And um, the grandson still runs it today. Um, but yeah, Benji's restaurant is, uh, is I love it. <laughs> it's not good for me, it? but it's really good. <laughs> really good food. Who doesn't? Uh, all right. Well, um, it looks like we don't have more questions. Um, so I will, uh, uh, I'll just say, oh, and oh, maybe we do. The Lindbrook Deli. Yeah, I have a list of all the delis. Uh, that was one of them. And um, first and highest ranking Jews in OC politics. Well, Ben Dreyfus was the first Jewish mayor of Anaheim. I can tell you that. And there wasn't another one until the 1990s. <laughs> so that's <laughs> quite a gap. Um, but Jews were involved in politics in the very early parts of the um, pre-Orange County when it was still part of LA County. And um, to Tracy, I also miss Delhi. <laughs> I'm from New Jersey, so yeah. I mean, I lived in a lot of different places, but most recently from New Jersey. Um, and I do, if you want to, I have a list of all of the um, the different delis that were here. So none of them were kosher, but that's part of Orange County. Orange County has always been a very, because we're so spread out, the Jews that settled here were not Orthodox. Because if you're Orthodox, you need, you need to walk to synagogue, you need to have a kosher butcher, you know, there's certain requirements that you have. And so you'll see Orthodox communities are, they live close together. Um, and Orange County d doesn't have that. We don't have a hub like Boyle Heights or Lower East Side. And it, I mean, Santa Ana sort of, um, but, but it, it just, the Jews that established themselves here were German Jews originally and German Jews were, were not, they were reformed. They started the reform movement. Um, they were very Jewish, but they were very comfortable you know, not keeping kosher and not observing all the holidays and they had Christmas trees and, um, you know, it was just, but they were Jewish. They were generally speaking, they married other Jews, but they were not observant. 
so that kind of trickled down to the next generations. Now you have a, a more vibrant Orthodox community as Orange County has grown and as we, we have more Jews. Um, but there's still a small segment of the Jews that live here. Well, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation and for answering so many questions. And thank you, know, thank you to everybody who's attending this evening and was part of this. Um, learning and 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 asking good questions yeah. and um, i'm uh, looking forward to uh, having you back and i would love uh, to come back and hopefully the pandemic will be over and i could actually come in person that would oh, be oh awesome. yeah i know we're all looking forward to that yeah so, um, being able to meet in person you know we that's the thing about historical societies yes it's historical and you have to do that part and that's important that's right. what brings you together but Boy, that society part's important too. It is. And, it um, is. I agree. We got a little of that here tonight, but um, you know, we should all be we should all be doing this over punch and cookies and uh, <laughs> milling around until the the they finally kick us out in the parking lot and then talking for another hour. You know, yes. that's a rich tradition. Absolutely. So, My children yeah. joke with me. They they're like, "Mom, you talk to dead people." You know. <laughs> I'm like, not only dead people, I talk to live people too, guys. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh, that's uh, occupational hazard. Yes. So, um, but uh, thank you all. Um, yes, thank Monica, you. Monica, and uh, since I won't be seeing a lot of you until after that, also Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Yes. And um, we'll, uh, we'll see you back in January. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. You've been a wonderful audience. Um, and happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year, and may we all be safe and healthy, and, um, and just continue to, yeah, <laughs> be good, to be good. All right. Good night, thank everyone. You. Chris, Thanks, thank Danny. you for inviting me. This was a pleasure. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dahlia. Thank you You're so much. You're welcome. Nice to meet everybody virtually. Enjoy your doggy. <laughs> yes, I will enjoy yours, too. Enjoy your